to one of our CTC virtual events. We are starting Asian Pacific Heritage Month, and we are starting off with a bang. We have a wonderful speaker. Um, this is Grace Kim. She is the assistant director director of the residence hall over at Baylor University. So she's definitely going to have a life story to tell us. Before we get started, um, make sure that you go and register for the event. Remember that registering for events puts you on a list for our library scholarships. So um, go to the library website, look for events, and you will be able to register. So I'm going to go ahead and give the floor to Ms. Kim and take it away. <clears throat> Welcome. Hello, nice to be here. I'm so glad to be here. Um, like um, Cindy said, I'm Grace Kim. I'm the Assistant Residence Hall Director at Baylor University in Waco. Um, I'm really excited to share my story today. I think this is such a really cool program that you do at CTC and um, I actually took a summer class at CTC a few years ago, and so um, I think it's such a great um, way for getting to know the lives of different people um, that are really, you know, living different lives from you and breaking down those stereotypes and getting out of your little bubble every once in a while. Um, and so when I thought about what I could share today, I wasn't really sure where I could start. And so I kind of decided to just start at the beginning. Um, and so for me, I'm a big reader. I love reading books and growing up. That was just like a thing I loved doing. Um, just like Harry Potter and like the Hunger Games, even Twilight. Um, and so that was really fun for me. And so when I think back and look at my life, I think of my life as kind of a big storybook of sorts. Um, and so when I think about the beginning of my story, I often think of it as like the introduction of a memoir. Um, so I've read a lot of those recently. One of my favorites um, have been Homework by Julie Andrews and The Ride of a Lifetime by Walt Disney Company CEO Bob Iger. And I think just listening to um, them talk about their life and how they what lessons they've learned throughout their life is so interesting, especially for people more experienced than me or in leadership positions or having, you know, who have lives super different than Leah than I do. Um, so if I were to look at my life, especially my life in Korea for the first um, few years of my life, it feels like it was just the introduction section to the, a book of like my life, just where it's not really like a main plot of my life story, but the background information is super important to have um, context into my life, um, because obviously that's kind of where my heritage comes from and um, how I <clears throat> kind of look at things and see how I live my life is based around some of those cultural heritages and cultural um, implications and how I grew up. And so I was born on the southern coast of South Korea um, in a little town called Changwon. And um, I grew up there. I grew up as a pastor's kid. Um, I played piano. I, I attended an arts kindergarten. And then I started first grade um, and then immediately moved to the US like a few months later. And so it feels unreal because I was so young. Literally, I was like six years old when I moved. And so I just have random snippets of memories from childhood, like writing. Um, with my maternal grandmother on her moped around her, her farm that my grandparents lived on or taking piano lessons from my other grandmother um, who was very strict, but I learned a lot of skills through her. Um, and then like family trips to Baskin Robbins, which is where we loved eating pistachio almond ice cream. And because it was like one of the few places my mom really liked to eat ice cream. And so I have just a random scattered group of memories and skills. Um, from my time in Korea, just like the fact that like Korean was my first language or that I um, learned piano super early on so that I could literally play the entirety of For Elise by Beethoven for my first grade talent show, which honestly, when I think back, I'm like those poor other kids in that talent show. Why did my parents let me do that? I feel bad that they had to go after me playing for Elise. Um, but because I was so young, I didn't really have any like core memories, which if you've seen Inside Out, um, it's a device basically used to um, explain how major moments in our lives <clears throat> shape our personalities. So I didn't really have those core memories from childhood because I was so young. Um, <clears throat> and so those core memories came later on. And so <clears throat> then fast forward to 2001, 
um, our family emigrated to the U.S. to Nebraska. So we had family um, up there. We had my grand, my paternal grandmother's siblings lived there. Um, and so we moved to Nebraska, which is super random. And anytime I tell people, they're like, why Nebraska? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, so we moved there <clears throat> and I know a lot of people don't remember childhood as perfect but for me when i look back at the four years we lived in nebraska it seemed very like surreal and kind of um almost like a fairy tale book where everything was like kind of perfect even though i knew things objectively were not um because we were new to the country uh, my parents didn't really speak english we didn't have any money um i was like you know trying to start school with like not even knowing english and so that was kind of the reality of the situation. But for me, when I look back, I'm like, that was just a really good childhood. Um, it's like my dad works two jobs. My mom worked at the tailor shop that my great aunt owned. And then we lived with our extended family for like one to two years. Um, and so, you know, it, objectively, if I was thinking back, like if I was an adult in that situation, I'd be so stressed. And my parents, you know, did have a hard time but they were able to make a childhood that was very happy and like suburban and just like you know something you would see in a movie and so these challenges didn't really feed into my perception of what my childhood should be and as far as i knew i had a very picturesque suburban uh, american childhood in nebraska in omaha which is the most random place um so like i remember having birthday parties at the McDonald's play places, which I don't even know if they do that anymore, but you used to be able to like rent out the playroom and like have a birthday party there. And I did that for like my seventh birthday and it was just so much fun. Um, I remember having pool parties with like my church friends. I remember going to vacation Bible school and I remember like jumping into piles of leaves that we raked up at my friend's house in the in autumn because we had actual seasons up there. Um, unlike Texas where we don't really get to do that um, or even just like watching PBS kids after school. Um, that was just, you know, memories that I remember um, having and they were just <clears throat> I look back and think very fondly of them. But I also remember very vividly, like not remembering, not knowing how to spell my own name, my new English name <laughs> on the first day of school, because, you know, Grace is my English name, given name. It directly translates from my Korean name, but I, because, you know, we had transitioned and starting a new school, my great aunt was like, this is what your name means in English. So this is what you should go by. And so I was like, okay, but I got to school and I was like, I don't know how to spell my name. So when I had to like write it on like a, a worksheet we were doing, um, I had to like copy it off of the pencil box that my great aunt had written on it. Like, you know, I don't remember what the brand was, but it was like that bottom half was like plastic and the top half was like a different color. And we used to make like bookmarks from like the little thing at the top with glue. Anyways, <clears throat> so I remember those like very vivid memories that are not normal for a, a normal first grader to go through because English was such a new language to me. And I had to go through an English as a second language class every day to learn English. Thankfully, I graduated from that after just one year because my teacher was like, you're way too good at English. You don't need to be in this class, which whenever I tell people they're like, you know, when they find out that I'm was an immigrant and like <clears throat> English is not my first language they're like, wow, your English is like. I there's like no accent like and I'm like. Yeah, I pick up on my, I think I pick up on languages pretty well, but I also think at that age, like age 6 is a really good place to learn a new language and be able to pick it up like it's a native language. Another part of like my childhood in Nebraska was just the fact that Omaha wasn't very diverse and I think looking back. I can't even remember having a single black classmate. Um, I had one Hispanic friend. She and I were really close and I um, still kind of keep up with her to this day. And then I have, I had um, just me and my sister were the only Asian kids at my school. So out of a school, I think there were like 300 students at that elementary school. So it's fairly small, but uh, she and I were the only Asian kids. And uh, I just remember it being like kind of weird and but at the same time, I didn't really have anything to compare it to because I came from Korea and everyone's Korean in Korea and and I came to the US and I was like, okay, I guess this is what it's like. Um, but I also had the benefit of ignorance as a kid, just seeing the world through rose colored glasses. 
I wasn't really aware of any side eyes or glances or microaggressions that we might have gotten as a Korean immigrant family or even just my parents had maybe gotten, you know, just like little glances or like little snide comments of like, oh, you're don't even speak English, like go back to your country. Like I didn't see any of that because I was so young. But I know it wasn't very easy for them, especially considering, you know, their families were thousands of miles away in Korea. Um, they had no money and tensions were really high after the fact that um, the terrorist attacks on 9-11 was like five or six months after we moved here. And so like you know, a lot of Americans were not happy about immigrants or not happy about seeing quote unquote outsiders um, coming into their country. And so that was kind of hard. And but at the same time, the four of us had each other. And that's kind of what made our memories, my memories of our time. there really great. And we had a great church community um, and some just like good friends that were supportive along that way, along the way while we were there. And so that was really cool. And um, you know, I still think back and I'm like, what a strange childhood. It feels kind of surreal just because I look back and it's like, it feels like something from a movie, like a coming of age story or something like that. Um, but then I think back and I'm like, those are my memories. <laughs> um, and so we had fun with the little things that we had, the little money we had, and we were able to appreciate our time together as a family, kind of going through this difficult time together, um, like coming to a new country and um, learning a new language, like my sister, I remember, um, she went to preschool and she was even younger than I was. And so she went to preschool and I remember her, my mom telling the story of how my sister came home from preschool one day and she was so sad and was like crying because they were telling, they were doing a story time at, at preschool and um, all the other kids were laughing at the story, but she couldn't understand what they were saying. And so she was like really sad that she couldn't laugh along with them. And so it's like little things like that, where it's like they kind of shaped our memories and shaped kind of how we grew up that were very different from other kids in our school and at our church, um, but kind of shaped who we are now. And so that was really, really awesome. And we had, um, you know, I have great memories of it still. And we still have friends up there, but I think looking back, I it was just a, uh, you know, four years of really, really hard times, but also a lot of like happy memories as well. Like I remember my 10th birthday party was just the most fun. And we went to like an indoor play place um, that was like a jungle gym and like you got to climb all these things and they had a pool and like um, a foam pit and things like that. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but that was kind of, you know, a weird thing to look back and be like, oh, I really was a child and I was looking through rose colored glasses and um, not seeing the hard things as much as I would have if I was older. And so that's definitely something I keep in mind when I look back at those times. And um, as I get older, I hear more stories from my parents about how hard it actually was um, and how homesick they were. And uh, I get more appreciation for kind of what they stuck through um, and you know, being uh, really mindful to make sure that my, me and my sister's experiences were still good and still happy. Um, but uh, before I move on to my next uh, section, are there any questions for me in the chat? Yes, yeah. I actually had a question. Yeah. So I know that it was probably a, a lot more difficult for you when you were <clears throat> younger uh, with the language barrier, but can you appreciate <clears throat> it a lot more now that you, you know, you're bilingual, if not, you know, knowing other languages? I know it's a better appreciation of it now. Yes, I will say my Korean is definitely not as good as it used to be as a kid. Um, I think just because growing up, I didn't. I was very just like assimilated with American culture and I didn't have a lot of Korean friends growing up. And so uh, I mostly spoke English. And so, as you can tell, my English is very good. And so I, my Korean is not as well good. Okay. Um, but I still definitely appreciate the fact that I can still read and write Korean and I can understand it pretty well, even though I can't speak it all that great. I'm still fluent, but I'm not, it's just not at the level that I would like to be at. Um, and also, I think I've realized like knowing Korean has helped me learn other languages. So I studied Spanish in high school and college and I was I, I was a Spanish minor for like a hot second in college. I couldn't finish the minor, but 
Um, I was I just have a deep appreciation for languages and linguistics and how different people from different countries communicate um, both like through verbal language processing, but also like nonverbal cues. I think that's definitely a thing like I've learned uh, with my Korean heritage of like. There's a lot of different nonverbal cues that happen in other cultures that is not super prevalent in American culture, although it is still really um, prevalent. And so I think I have definitely have appreciation for like communication in general. It's not just just the language, but also like, you know, how you say things and um, picking up on connotations. And then also like I'm able to have the mindset of like, oh, I remember how it was when it was I didn't understand this. And so when I meet someone whose second language is English or third language is English. I have a lot of friends that are like multilingual and um, and if they get like confused about like an idiom or um, like different phrases that we use or slang or um, like just connotations that, you know, certain words actually have a negative connotation versus a positive connotation, even though they mean the same thing. Um, I've been able to kind of explain that to them a little bit better with the diff that extra mindset of like uh, having that background of being uh, a second language learner. Cool. Okay, I, so we actually do have a question on uh, Facebook uh, from Christina Lee, and she also says, thank you for sharing your story. Her question is, how do you think your experience as an immigrant or from a different culture has helped your role as um, in your current position? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think for me, it's all the idea of, um, you know, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but kind of the identity of like, where do I belong? And like, what is what is my background? And what is my heritage of being an immigrant? How does that tie into who I am now? And how does that show up in different places? Like, for instance, like having history with like going back to Korea um, for the first time in like 15 years or so, like a few years ago, um, the feeling of like going back home and being like home home is the motherland um as and then going there and being like oh i'm super american like i am an american but also like i look like all the other people here so it's like a weird dichotomy of like i look like all the asians here but i am clearly not the same we don't have the same lifestyle because i've grown up in the us and i've you know, have a lot of the American values. And so it's a little, diff a little different in how that shows up. Um, as far as my job, I think um, it shows up in the way of like understanding of where different people come from. My, um, I mean, I have a lot of residents um, in my hall and a lot of them, some of them are, um, you know, uh, international students. And so they are not American, but I also have some that are, you know, immigrant kids or also are also immigrants themselves. And so when I have those conversations, especially with like my student leaders, um, I'm able to come from that perspective of understanding more of what that is actually like um, and kind of relating on those things. If especially when a lot of times they might feel like there's no one else that understands that or they might not have a lot of friends that understand that experience firsthand, because um, sometimes, you know, it's it's great to have that support of you know, I understand your story and I am like thankful that you're here and, you know, are supportive in that way, but it's not the same thing as talking with someone who has actually lived that experience um, and actually knows what it's like firsthand. And so I think that kind of support really helps. Great response, great answer. And I was I, just I, gonna I, chime in that I really, you know, wish I could have brought my kids up learning a different language. I wish, I think it would have served them well, even myself, you know, I started off with French in high school and college, but I just I never awesome. stuck with it. So, you know, I don't speak it fluently, but it's something I definitely wish I could go back and do. Yeah. Um, before you move on, I just have one quick question. Did your parents speak English when they moved over here? They had a very basic understanding of English um, because in Korea, actually, you learn English in school. So um, you you learn basic English and like just going through secondary school um, in Korea. And so most Koreans have a general basic understanding of English. It's just the speaking and the conversational more type things that is more difficult. Um, they learned pretty quickly and they're really good now, but 
So it's definitely a process, especially in casual conversations. I think that's, you know, when you learn, you know, even if you took Spanish classes in high school, it's like very formal of like, hello, how are you? How is the weather? You know, very like certain yeah. phrases that you know how to say, but when you're having a conversation, you're not just, you're not gonna only say those five phrases that you've learned in class. <laughs> um, and so I think that's the, that was the challenge for them. <clears throat> hey, thank you. Yeah. Um, so in 2004, I, my dad got a senior pastoring job here in central Texas, um, just down the road from CTC at, in Harker Heights. And so that church was looking for a new full-time pastor for several years. And my dad was looking for a new full-time position as well. And so he got the job and in December, we packed our bags and moved down to Colleen. It was very different than what I had known before. <laughs> um, as a 10 year old, I was fully convinced that Texans rode horses to school and I was like, they're all cowboys. It was weird. Um, I think people still think that now, but I have to be like, no, we're not like that. But I do see horses on the side of the road a lot. Like I've seen horses being ridden just like on the side of the street several times in high school. Um, but Texas life was pretty different. And so for one, we didn't, there, there's no winter really or seasons. And so um, compare that to Nebraska where we did have all four seasons. Um, it was very different. And then uh, another switch was like, I couldn't understand my gym teacher's Texas accent for several weeks. Um, I just had one teacher who just had a really strong accent. And so I couldn't understand him for a little bit. Um, but under overall, like I adjusted pretty well and it was a good experience for me to have such a diverse school. Um, Colleen being a military town, it was very like a lot of different cultures, a lot of different like backgrounds and people coming from all over the world. And so that was really cool. And then also being able to attend a church that was much bigger than the one that my dad led in Nebraska was really great. Um, and I made some really close church friends that way that were my age who were also Korean. Um, some of them a half, some of them um, full Korean. And so that was really cool. But middle school and high school were kind of where I discovered my love for band, which is kind of like I was thinking back and I'm like, I don't remember anything I did in middle school and high school other than band, like band was my life um, and music in general. And so I'd already grown up playing piano, but with band, um, it opened up a whole new world. And so after copying my friend into what instrument she wanted to play, because she wanted to play clarinet and I was like, I'm just going to do what you're doing. Um, I found a passion for a band that I still to this day credit to my sixth grade band teacher, Miss Jackson. I love her and she just made band so fun and so um, exciting for me. And it was just a lot of fun in middle school. And so I got into band, region band, solo and ensemble contests. Um, and in high school, I got into like area band auditions, region band, and then I did like solo and ensemble at the state level with some friends for concert band. Um, but another huge part of that was doing marching band yeah, and Texas marching band is a whole nother thing in itself, but I, that experience was such a huge part of my um, adolescence and just, it was where I made all my friends, my community. I learned really great life lessons. Like there's some that my high school band teacher says to me, all, like that he said like every day. Um, and one, it was like, cause I had band first period and he would always say, have a great day or don't, it's up to you. Uh, and that still sticks to me, um, sticks with me. And then the other one was like, if you're early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. And if you're late, you're left behind. And so that was another thing that's like, you know, that really um, accented like how important it is to be prompt and like on time and stuff like that. And so I learned some life lessons that way. And then I also like learned a lot of teamwork um, skills with marching competitions because there'd be 150 of us and we'd have to put on a new show and then, you know, learn all the sets and learn all the music and memorize all the music and memorize everything and then go and perform and compete in um, these competitions against a bunch of other schools in our region. Um, and so that was a lot of fun. But I also learned like leadership skills. I, you know, became a section leader and then I became drum major who is like basically the head leader of the whole marching band um, for my junior and senior year. And so those opportunities were honestly just really um, transformative and like learning how I um, can lead well. Um, not saying I was perfect because I was definitely had some flaws in high school, um, but I was able to learn how to do those things and then be, you know, grow in confidence of like, oh, I'm, I naturally ended up being 
put in leadership positions throughout high school and like, how can I use these skills and apply them to other things? Um, and so that was just really a lot of fun and I just have a lot of fond memories and my best friends are still from band and um, that was just a lot of fun. Um, and then I, I obviously like academics, those, I mean, that went well too, but I was like so focused on band, but I did well in school. I did well in my AP classes and I had good friends throughout those classes. Um, but one thing I remember is junior year, I had to write a 10 page research paper. Cause that was like the year we learned how to write research papers. Um, but the, the topic was like a college of our choice for English three junior year. And so I chose Baylor um, after doing some general research of like Texas schools. I was like, I, my knowledge. So since my parents had gone to school in Korea, uh, had gone to college in Korea, they didn't know anything about the US university systems or anything like that other than the Ivy leagues. And I was like, I'm not going to an Ivy league school. That's not going to happen. Um, and so I, you know, I was kind of on my own in that way. Um, kind of similar to like a first generational student. And so um, this paper really helped me learn about how to research for schools and what to what's important to know. And um, and so this was a cool opportunity and it was the perfect school for me. Um, Baylor, it was mid size. It wasn't too far from home. Waco's just an hour from Colleen. So that was just great. Um, they had great academic programs. and I wanted to learn um, to do business classes. And so I did that. Um, it was a Christian university. And so as I had gone through 12 years of, you know, 1st through 12th grade in the public school system, I wanted something different and kind of wanted to see what would what it would be like to work, go to a Christian private school. And so that was another perk. And um, it was just a beautiful campus. When I visited campus for the 1st time, I still remember that feeling of like, this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm going to go here. Um, and so that was just really amazing. And um, my dad was like, you're going to have to figure out how to pay for it because we don't have the money. And I was like, I'm going to make it happen. Um, and it did. I managed to get the scholarships and it was great and um, managed to be able to afford school. And so that was really, really amazing. Um, and so um, I came to Baylor um, and kind of just, you know, I came here and I was like, Okay, we'll just get a fresh start. We'll see what happens. Um, but what was interesting is when I came here, um, you know, throughout the four years, I started realizing that I feel like I didn't fit in with the Asian groups because I didn't feel Asian enough. And then I also was at a predominantly white school. So then I was like, I don't, I'm not white. So I was like, I'm not white enough either. So like, where do I fit in? Um, and so the something that was really great is third band, I was able to find community again. So marching band at Baylor starts like two weeks before classes start a week, two weeks, something like that. We move in early and then we do a week of band camp. And so obviously you're with these kids for like with each other for like the whole week. And so I was able to find like literally my three best friends from band. I met like the first week before school even started and we stayed friends throughout college and I was even I'm still friends with them now. I went to one of their weddings like last year. And so it's been really cool to find that community through band again. Um, and so community, you know, was a huge part of my college experience of finding community. Um, it was overall college, you know, was an amazing time. And I thankfully found my community like through band and then also through church, through my small groups. Um, and that's kind of where I made my girlfriends. We you know, some of them I ended up roommate being roommates with junior and senior year, and I'm still really close with them now. Um, and I stayed with those, you know, two, you know, I had one small group from church and then I had a small group from band. And so we all like stayed close friends throughout the entire four years, which is honestly kind of impressive. Um, but academics was definitely a challenge um, for, for me. I you know, growing up, I did really well in school without having to try super hard. And so I was used to that. And then I came to college and I was like, oh, I'm not as smart as I thought. Um, and I'm competing against all these other people who are also really like at the top of their class and like did really well in school. And so I had to learn how to study and like how to do well. And then also like learn how to not put all my, you know, all my worth in my grades. And so that was really hard, but um, I managed to get a business degree um, it was hard because I was like realizing, you know, as I was going through my business degree, like junior, senior year, I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. I don't think this is what I want to do for my life. And so um, that was an interesting journey of like figuring out, okay, so what I'm going to do, what am I going to do next? Um, 
And so by senior year, my life was a huge dichotomy of trying to figure out, you know, enjoying the current season of like enjoying my senior year, having fun with my friends, but also being super stressed about what am I going to do after graduation? So I loved my social life of like getting really involved with an organization called Student Foundation, which uh, we basically serve Baylor students that were current students. And then we also like talk to alumni to raise scholarships. And then we also um, go to like college high school, I mean, high school college fairs to kind of recruit for Baylor. And so that was a lot of fun. We got to march in the homecoming parade. Um, there was a picture taken at that parade that is still on like a bunch of Baylor websites and like we were the magazine a few years ago. And so that was really fun. But I was also kind of miserable finishing up my accounting degree and not knowing what job I would want to end up doing after graduation because I didn't want to do accounting anymore. And so thankfully I had a summer internship lined up after graduation, but I still was like, okay, I'm just going to try this out. It's only for two months. Um, we'll see how I feel after and kind of going to, I knew I was going to have to probably switch courses and figure out what I wanted to do after that. Um, any questions up until now, like through college? No, ma'am. Okay, great. I, I'm excited to to hear where this went, <laughs> especially how did you tell your parent, hey, what a degree I got, I'm not sure I want. So yeah. I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to hear the rest of this story. <laughs> Me too. Okay. Me too. Great. Um, so thankfully, my summer internship went really great. I had a really good time. I worked for um, one of the top accounting firms in um, in the in the U.S. and so. I worked that summer, made a lot of new friends, worked in a corporate America job. I was like, this is what you see in movies of like working in downtown Dallas, literally on Main Street and like getting a parking garage pass and like walking to walking to my office in like business professional clothing and working on the 18th floor. Um, and that was a really cool experience of just getting a taste of what that's like. But the more I was working there, I was like, I'm glad I'm not going to be working here long term because I don't think I could do this. Like, I think after a year, I would be like, I'm done. I can't work this much. Um, and so I was like, I need something a little bit more personable, but also like more meaningful in my, you know, for me. And so after that internship, I moved back home and started job searching because, you know, I didn't have a job lined up. And so that was a very depressing time, honestly. Like it was really hard because I had no friends back home because they were all like either in college still or they had just graduated and gone to their adult jobs. I had no friends like back in Colleen where my parents lived. Um, and then of course I had no job. And, you know, it was kind of just like, I just stayed in my room all the time watching Netflix and applying for jobs and constantly getting rejected. And so that was an interesting six months, um, very hard, very stressful, but thankfully I had really supportive parents. Um, my parents were, um, you know, very just like reassuring in the sense, like, it's okay. Like you can live here as long as you need to, and then you can just find a job that will be a good fit for you that you want to do in the future. Um, and I didn't really know what it was at the time I was applying for all different types of um, jobs, like business jobs, admin jobs, literally, and I applied to like jobs at Disney. I was like, if Disney hires me, I'm good. Um, and so that was a lot of interesting, like back and forth of like putting myself out there. And then like some companies don't even email you saying you got rejected. They just like, you never hear from them again. So that was interesting. But, um, <clears throat> and then another part of that was like, just that loneliness of like, no one tells you how lonely that like year after you graduate a year or two years after you graduate college um of like that young adulthood especially if you're not married at that time it's like going after going after 16 years of constant school and friends around you all the time having the same schedule and then you go to like you're graduated and like you have like no friends and then you're like or you're in a new city and you don't have friends and then you have a new job that you maybe like or don't like and so <laughs> i think that's not talked about enough but I trusted that God had a plan and uh, my parents were very supportive, like I said before. And um, in November, a job opened up at Baylor Law School, um, which was kind of, which was perfect because I had previously worked at the law school in undergrad as a student worker. And so I had the opportunity to go back to Waco um, and I applied for that job. 
And at the on campus interview, um, this was like, I think, December time. Um, I realized that I, what I really wanted to do was student affairs. So basically just working with college students or college aged students and help basically support them in pursuing their dreams of like getting their education, but also like college is a very transformative time. And I knew that I wanted to be there to kind of coach them along that way, but also like hold their hand if they need it for a little bit or kind of just give them that push they need to like believe in themselves because, you know, that self-confidence will really wreck you sometimes. Um, I was on the on-campus interview doing a group interview with a panel of people and one of them asked me, like, where do you see yourself five, ten years down the road? And I was like, I just want to help college students, like, achieve their dream, honestly. And then as I was saying it, you know, when you do interviews, you kind of BS some of your answers. And But when I was answering that, I was like, in the middle of saying it, I, like, stopped and I was like, actually? That is what I want to do. I think I figured it out. And so that was really great. And um, I got that job, which was great. And so I got into the law school. I worked there for almost like a, about a year and nine months. And so I worked in the admissions office doing an admin work for admissions and financial aid. That was a lot of fun. I loved, you know, everyone at the law school was just amazing. I loved being back in Waco. I still had a few friends in town. Um, and so I made new friends of like young adulthood after graduation. Um, and that was just a great time for me to like figure out what I wanted to do. And um, that's when I started transitioning to thinking about what I wanted to do for grad school. And if I wanted to go to grad school after working at the law school and thinking about student affairs and what I could do with that, because I had a few friends that were in grad school for student affairs at that time. So I reached out to him. Um, but then as in the middle of like thinking about what I wanted to do for grad school, uh, a friend told me about a hall director job that was opening or that had been open and they were still looking for applicants. And so I was like, I have no, I have no experience in being an RA or working in the residence hall. I was not involved in my residence hall when I lived in on campus. Um, but she was like, no, it's fine. Like, you don't have to be that experienced in this position because it's an assistant residence hall director job. Um, it is not as demanding and you don't have to have a master's degree and I was like well perfect opportunity I get free housing get Pete paid and then get a meal plan and then I also like because I knew I wanted to go into student affairs I was like I can test out whether or not housing or residence halls is something I want to do long term so I was like okay I'll go for it even though I have no experience <laughs> um but they decided to hire me and they took a chance and they're like we can see that you love Baylor and that's a great opportunity and you are committed to growing and learning about yourself and also like supporting these students and that's what's really important. And so I got the job in October of 2019. And so I started and it was, this job has probably been the most transformative time in my life. Um, college was very transformative, but I think in the past year and a half to almost two years, I've grown so much as a person and kind of figuring out who I am what I'm passionate about, how I work, um, what my strengths are, what my weaknesses are, what I need to do to continue to be a really great leader in universities, but also just like in my life and relationships. And so I learned about, you know, my identities for like intersectionality. That word, I think, changed my life. Um, basically, intersectionality is the intersection of different identities you hold. So if for me specifically, I am Korean, but I'm also American. And I'm also a woman, so what does that look like? I'm also a Christian, so how do all of those things like intersect and how does that show up in different relationships and different um, things that I am passionate about and how I approach um, my work? I also learned a lot about introspection and reflection because this job, it is very heavy at some times. You carry a lot of burdens for residents, concerns, um, my staff concerns. I have a staff of 17. Um, young women. And so, you know, if they're going through something and you're walking them, walking with them through those hard things, like you're carrying a lot of burdens of these people, but then it's like, okay, so how, what does this mean for me? Do I have to hold on to all this on my own? Um, the answer is no, you should definitely always let other people support you. Um, but also it was like reflecting on like myself and who I am and what I want in my life and what's important to me. And then I also like, you know, work, learned about working with others. You do a lot of teamwork and committees and um, 
myself, I have a partner in this job. And so my co-hall director, she is um, my supervisor, but also she and I are partners in managing the building. And so how can we work together with our strengths and our weak like differences and like, you know, balance each other out and like, how can we bounce off of each other? Um, <clears throat> also with setting expectations, like what are my expectations for what I do in this job? What are other people's expectations of me? What are my expectations of other people? And clearly communicating those things. And that came with practice and also a lot of therapy. Um, I started going to therapy and um, I also like learned how to talk about my feelings and having hard conversations because we have to have those conversations in this kind of job where you're dealing with people and like people's feelings and people's development and growth and student leadership. Um, and then, of course, like supervising students and learning how to do that, because I was like, I'm only a few years older than these students. How am I supposed to be their boss? Um, but I've learned that and I've learned what works and what doesn't and what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. Um, and then, of course, like the pandemic has really shifted a lot of what we do and I've learned how to be flex flexible and be a team player and really pick up, you know, what other people are putting down and then also like being okay with changing gears very frequently all the time. Literally last year, like from April to June, I think we we switched plans like every week. And so that was a lot of work, but it was really um, a time of growth because I was like, I'm just going to let go of control. Going to see what happens. I'm going to let go and see like, I'm just going to control what I can. And if I can't control it, I'm going to let it go and just go with the flow. But this job has also been a confirmation that this is the field that I want to be in long term. Um, I've kind of realized like I love especially working with student leaders and helping them develop their skills um, and challenging them, but also supporting and encouraging them. I think Generation Z is, you know, there's a lot of hurt and uh, there's a lot of um, mental health issues. There's a lot of self-confidence issues with all different things going on in their lives. And so I want to be able to kind of mentor them and coach them along that way and just be like, no, you are doing a great job and I believe in you and I'm proud of you. Even if you think you're not doing well, like I'm really proud of you and the, the work that you've done and the growth that you've had in the past six months that I've been supervising you. Um, and so that's been a really rewarding process. And I have a few seniors that graduated last year that I still keep in contact with. One of them, she actually got a job at Baylor. And so I'm like, I'm just like so proud of like seeing their growth and like seeing how they're succeeding and doing really well and how what they've learned in this job has um, really come into play in other parts of their job, which is really, really amazing. But yeah, before I go on to like kind of where I am now, I'd love to answer any other questions that y'all might have. Yes, I have a question. Uh, you came into your new position, it sounds like maybe towards the beginning of the pandemic. How did you feel about that, you know, coming into a not so new organization because you were already familiar, but still a new position. I the transition was hard. I think I came in in October of 2019, so I had like four months of normalcy, and then we shut down for the pandemic, and so that was weird. Of like, oh, this is what I it's like to do this job. This job is already hard in itself. Um, being a hall director is one of the hardest jobs you can have on a university campus, in my opinion. A lot falls on this on this position, but. Um, I felt, you know, here's the thing. I think if I were to have gone through that without a supportive team, I would have been a disaster. But because my department, the C Campus Living and Learning at Baylor, is a very supportive and very um, tight-knit community. And so we, you know, their team of hall directors, there's like 18 of us or 20 of us. Um, we've been able to bounce off of each other and really depend on each other and have times to cry of frustration or like have times to really like talk about what we're scared about um or be vulnerable with each other um that i don't think i ever had before and it was especially in a work setting and so having that support system has really made all the hard stuff feel like i can handle it if that makes sense so 
I think especially also in my building, the other two women that I work with in the professional world, like um, my co-hall director and then our um, resident chaplain, the three of us were around the same age. And so we really depended on each other in the past two years. We both, we all three of us came into the role pretty new. They started like two months before I did, but like they were also new to this position. And so, you know, really depending on each other and leaning on each other has been the best thing. And I think, you know, some of these people I'm definitely going to be friends with for life. Uh, and I'm just really grateful to have them. I think that's what made it worthwhile and that I've even made it this far. I can't credit all of it to my own, <laughs> my own doing, because I know that I wouldn't have been able to do it without the support. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, you, Grace. You, you knew that you, um, you know, you didn't know what you wanted to be. That I've heard that so many times people graduating and they don't know what they want to be. Do you encounter that in your job? And what are some of the things that you help your residents if they encounter, especially if their parents, you know, they couldn't afford to put them in college and it's like, you're going to be this and, you know, you're not going to go do another four years into different. How do you deal with that? I think for me, um, First off, I think when parents get involved, it's so complicated because like, yes, it's their money, but it's not their life. And so for me, thankfully, I didn't have the pressures from my parents to do a certain thing. But it's funny because I'm kind of talking through this with my brother at the moment because he's about to be a senior in, college, in high school. And so he's like thinking about where am I going to school and what I want to study? And I'm like, just find something that you enjoy learning about and learn about that and then graduate because most times than not, you're not gonna do a job within your field that you studied. I think most people that I know, especially people I graduated with, they're not doing anything near what they actually graduated with a degree in. Unless you're doing medical work or engineering, like those two things, obviously you have to have a specific degree to do that work, but most jobs don't, they just require a bachelor's degree. <laughs> and so for me, what I like to tell my students is, Find something you enjoy learning about and are passionate about and you're willing to learn and put in the work to make good grades in that field. Because at the end of the day, you'll have a degree from a good accredited university or whatever it might be. Um, and that's really what matters. It's like you've got the bachelor's degree in, you know, a, a BS in something like a bachelor of administration or bachelor's of arts, like jobs don't really check what kind of degree you got as long as you have a degree um, for the most part and so that's what i try to do as an encouragement of like you don't have to have it all figured out and you can also switch your gear and like change course and change jobs whenever you want like when you graduate you're not set on one job for the rest of your life i think that is something that paralyzes a lot of college students is like i don't know what i want to do with the rest of my life and i'm like you don't have to know what you have to want to do for the rest of your life figure out what you want to do next and then kind of have an idea of what direction you want to go. But like odds are, like for me, who knew I was going to be a hall director? Like I was like, I don't know anything about housing. I don't know if I want to do this, but I'm here. And like, I think I know that I, I'm not really like, I don't know if I want to do housing in the future. Like, I don't know if that's something I want to do long term, but like I did it and I have that experience and I've, there's lessons that I've learned that I can carry into other positions that will be beneficial. There's always lessons you can learn in any job that will impact other areas of your life. And that's not just gonna be in a specific, you know, field of work. And so that's what I try to, that kind of usually helps. Um, I also try to tell them nobody else knows what they're doing either because they don't. From what I've heard from other adults that I know, nobody knows what they're doing, especially anyone in their twenties. If you ask them, they're like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. Even if they have a job that pays well. So. You're, they're not alone. I think that's something I need people to understand, especially college students that are like freaking out about comparing themselves to other people. It's like, you're not the only one in this boat. There's a lot of people struggling there with you and you're not alone. Um, you just, you know, there are some times you just have to get through the hard stuff and then you'll come out the other end a little bit stronger and then you'll be okay. So we have a really good question here on Facebook from, um, 
Madeline Pena, I think her name is. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but she says, hello, Grace. Uh, thank you for sharing your story. Since this past year brought, brought forth so much to light regarding who we are and how we show up, what is something you've learned about your inter intersecting identities as an Asian American woman? Yes, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I do want to kind of like hit on that because that's something I am has been impacting my life currently. And so intersectionality as a Korean American woman who's also a leader in different areas, I've learned more about, um, I've learned it with friends. So I've, you know, learned about having, I've learned that having conversations with my friends who know me well as a person and kind of processing different things I'm going through has been helpful. For me, I've had a friend whose name is March and she's also an Asian American woman and she's been kind of my partner in walking through this concept because we went through similar journeys of how our very white communities were impacting how we view ourselves even when it was unintentional because we came from diverse backgrounds but we also didn't feel super comfortable in all asian social groups because that's just not how we grew up and um, we felt that we were too white or american or just like othered in a lot of ways and so my intersectionality for me it shows up in my work in being a positive role model for other asian american students especially women because i don't remember seeing a single asian american staff member or faculty member when i was at school and also being an influence in different social circles where the white voices are the majority so how am i speaking up in um you know speaking on behalf of some like my my um, my culture, but also like other minority groups. Like I know a lot of times it's not even like intentional, but just because you have a lack of understanding, um, some some people in the white community just like are ignorant to the fact that there are other life experiences that can view a specific situation very differently just because they have a different life um, experiences. And so that's kind of how I try to do that in my work, but also my relationships, embracing my heritage and like sharing with my friends and how talking about how, you know, there are some things in my heritage that I don't want to carry on with me through, you know, for my next generation. But also there's a lot of great things about my heritage that I'd love to carry on with me, especially food and like um, holidays and things like that. Um, and sharing it with my friends that are not Korean or not Asian has been really fun. I had a, my best friend from college. She really brought that out in me because she would always ask really great questions and be really curious and wanting to know more about my culture, but also like being brave and sharing my story, like how I'm doing today. Um, but also like sharing it with people that are different or people that, you know, may not understand the Asian American lens of, um, and the Asian American experience. Um, but it also shows up in like how I interact with other minority groups, especially I think black Americans is a really big conversation right now is because for a long time, Asian Americans and black Americans have been pitted against each other. And so how can we go through and how can we resolve some of these um, negative feelings toward each other and how can we get to the root of the problem and how can we address the anti blackness in um, the Asian community and how can I have these conversations and being like, you know, why do you have this stereotype and why do we have this stereotype um, and talking about those? I think between both the Black Lives Matter movement and the rise of um, hate crimes against Asian American people, especially due to COVID-19, a lot of those conversations are being had right now. And I think I'm in a unique position of being an Asian American person um, and having the sphere of influence of my Asian American friends and community and my family, but also like growing up with a lot of black friends and growing up and like consuming um, culture from black Americans and having friends that are also passionate about, you know, representing their community as well. And how can we have those conversations together and how can we come together to combat those negative stereotypes and address the subtle racism that's so prevalent in both of our cultures against each other and come together to kind of fight that inner um, white supremacy and, um, you know, the, just the racism that is very prevalent in our culture. So that's definitely something that I've been really passionate about lately, especially in the past year. And um, I'm hoping to do that more and also like learning more about what that means for me and how I can be continuing to do the work in myself to make sure that I am being a good ally, but also being a good representative of my culture as well. 
Great, Great response. And I had a question. Um, wow. Uh, it was interesting that you made reference to, you know, what's going on as far as, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and then, you know, the now, you know, uplifting Asian Americans. Um, and then you may mention, you know, that we are, are often pitted against one another. Um, do you think that because there was so much support behind Black Lives Matter, do you think that um, that what's going on with Asians right now. Do you, do you see any kind of comparison between, or do you just feel in general that it should be just uplifting everyone? I mean, because black lives, black lives matter has been a big deal because there have been a consistent stream of, um, acts upon, you know, African Americans and we consistently, uh, losing our lives. You know, I have two sons. So for me, it's, it's a, it's a big worry. I have two mm -hmm. young black male sons and the world that they're growing up in is it, it's not, you know, it doesn't feel safe. It doesn't feel like the world I grew up in. So do you see a comparison? Do you see a parallel? Are you as worried? Um, do you feel, you know, afraid for, you know, people in your family or the males in your family, do you see any kind of real parallel? Yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of comparisons. I think for one, I think it's very clear that they're not the same. They're very different because I think, I mean, just the basic fact of the fact that Asian Americans heritage in America are very different than um, black Americans because the history of black Americans, like, that heritage they came from slavery and so like that in itself just because that was a systemic thing like we can't really compare the two but at the same time i think the asian american hate crimes and things like that is bringing to light a lot of um hidden history of like unknown history with asian americans in like internment camps and um uh really negative things with the chinese americans back in the in the 60s i want to say or the 50s um, and like all those kinds of things, it's bringing that up to light and being like, oh, there's a lot of history here that we didn't learn because X, Y, Z. Um, but at the same time, I think for Asian Americans, uh, especially for those who were not as vocal about the Black Lives Matter movement, I think with Asian Americans, they are finally understanding their personal fear of people attacking them and being like, oh, this is a little bit of a taste of what Black Americans go through all the time, especially Black males. And so I even had a conversation with an Asian friend the other day that was like, I feel bad that I was not supportive as much of the Black Lives Matter movement, especially last summer, because now I see what's happening to my community. And I not understand it exactly, but like you get a little taste of that and you're like, oh, this is what it feels like to go out in public and being be at you know, being fearful of my life. Um, I think personally, I definitely have had spouts of anxiety and fear of going out in public. Um, I've definitely done things like making sure I wear a Baylor shirt to show that I'm a Baylor college student to make sure like people are like, oh, she's a nice student. And I'm, I, you know, I look like a young kind of, it's, I'm small, I'm like five foot two and I look harmless. And so, and, and I'm a woman, so I'm like, there's a lot of things at play where it's like, oh, I could get attacked because I'm a woman because attacks on women in the US is very high. Um, or I could get attacked because I'm Asian and because that's been high. And I think especially with the Asian American attacks, a high majority of them have been against elderly, which kind of shows a little bit more of like, oh, you're going for like the super like helpless people. Like they're not young adults, they're not um, people who can fend for themselves, they're just walking down the street and for with no, like, so that's, I think that's definitely something that has been, you know, at the back of my mind. And I've heard stories from my parents of, you know, people they know that have gotten attacked. Um, and so it is scary. Um, but at the same time, I've been really careful not to try to live in fear because you just can't live life like that and enjoy it because you know, at the end of the day, we only have one life to live. And I think you've got to make life what it is. And 
Um, I think it's important to continue to do the work and continue to talk about really important topics. Um, but I think for me, I've had to learn how to um, live both being cautious, but also, you know, not being fearful to leave my house all the time, um, which also feeds into like my mental health of like, you know, I struggle with anxiety and how does that feed into that and not looking at the news all the time has been helpful and, um, you know, just putting barriers like that up, but yeah. <clears throat> Um, it's interesting something you said <laughs> when you were talking about your T-shirt and, you know, wearing it to show your, you know, solidarity and your support. It's funny because, you know, the the flip side of that is if I wear a T-shirt that, you know, uplifts my, you know, my background and my heritage, it's, al it's almost saying, you know, hey, it's almost like a challenge, mm -hmm. you know. So it's kind of interesting that paradox between your, you know, explanation and mine, you know, from yes. where I'm coming from, me being an African American woman, you know, yeah. and then also, you know, trying to live life without fear. It's it's difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, you know, we have to keep pushing on and we have to continue to go to work and we have to continue to get out there and drive our cars. But, you know, the fear is just so elevated. It's very real. Do you feel like you kind of um, do you feel like it's it's more in your face now? Do you feel like you're you're actually seeing a little bit a glimpse of what we have been going through as an African American people, what we've been going through for a little while now? Yeah, I think it definitely is, and I think you know, back to my like T-shirt example, is more of like how can I blend in the most, and people not see that I'm. Asian, which is ridiculous because like, if you look at me, I'm obviously Asian. Um, and I think that also goes into the, um, you know, the privilege that I have of my skin tone being the color that it is. If I have sunglasses on and a mask and a hat, you're not gonna be able to tell that I'm Asian. Um, whereas like for you, obviously you can't cover up all of your skin. Like that just doesn't make sense. And so, um, that is definitely something I have come like, you know, I've thought about, and I think that's, uh, really important to keep in mind. Um, but like I said, like it's, they're not completely comfortable situations. So I don't ever even try to like, be like, oh, I know exactly what you're going through because that's, that's just erasing a lot of extra context there that is systemic and that is, um, has been specifically targeting um, black communities for a really long time now. So um, I'm careful to say that, but I think it has made the Asian American community a little bit more of aware of like what that little bit of fear feels like, because for a long time we were considered the model minority and we, a lot of people um, fed into that myth of being that model minority of like, look at the Asian Americans. They're so successful and smart. Like, why can't all the other Asian other, you know, minorities be, you know, as successful as the Asian Americans? Um, but it's gotten to a point where it's like Asian Americans, especially people in my generation are getting to the point where we're like, nah, that's ridiculous. Um, we're not going to be quiet about this anymore. We go through racist things all the time. We just don't talk about it and we're not ever vocal about it because we, you know, in general, a lot of Asian Americans and Asian people in general, just like kind of suppress all the stuff that we go through and we don't talk about them. And so, um, I think that is also, you know, Kind of made aware in the mental health um, community as well of like a lot of Asian Americans and Asian people in general have mental health struggles and yet it's never really talked about because it's considered taboo and going to therapy um, and that's something I'm really passionate about because therapy has really helped me and has helped me grow as a person and has um, been a tool for me to be fully who I want to be and who I am um, and embrace myself but also not be crippled by anxiety all the time um, and so I like to, you know, bring that into the conversation as well and making sure that, um, especially other minority groups, um, because people, you know, people of color are more prone to health, mental health issues because of the other things that we go through other than just all the regular hardships, you know, that every, every American goes through. Um, and so I think that has been really helpful in having those honest conversations about therapy and, um, you know, being vulnerable with myself and being like, I, you know, even if it's just like right now of like, I was scared, like I literally a few weeks ago, I had a mental breakdown because I was like, 
I'm scared to go out in public. This was like the week after like all the shootings that happened. And I'm like, I could go to the grocery store and I could get hate crimes because I'm Asian, attacked because I'm a woman, or I could just get shot up for no reason. And so I was like, why are all these things happening? But then, you know, talking with my parents and like talking about it in therapy and being like, I can't have all of these um, thoughts in my head all the time because that's just going to be so crippling and um, really hard. And I have to hold on to the goodness in the world and the hope that there is. Um, for me, that's for my that's my faith and trusting that God will take care of me and not being afraid of death. Like, you know, death is not something, I, you know, a lot of us have thought about a lot recently because of COVID, but I think especially recently, I'm like, you know, have to be okay with like, if I die, I feel okay that I'm going to heaven because of my own faith. But, you know, there's a lot of scary things in the world, but I also have to be like reminded of the really good things and like reminded of my community that are all super supportive and my friends and the puppies and like sunny days, you know, all the little things that kind of add up and being like, okay, there's still really a lot of good things in the world. And I, if I just focus on all the negative things, you're just gonna like sit in a hole and be really depressed. Um, and so kind of shifting that mindset has been a process for me and a growing and learning moment. Um, and it's, I've had to be really intentional about it, but um, that has been helpful a lot. And, um, you know, for me, it's TV, films, watching uplifting things, talking to my friends, talking to my family, going outside to read books. Um, this weekend has was beautiful weather, or Sunday was. Saturday it rained all day, but Sunday was beautiful weather. And so I went outside to read and it was just like soaking up the sun. And for me, I'm getting really excited looking forward to the future. Even though I still have those anxieties, I'm looking forward to the future and being like, oh, I'm going to grad school um, so soon. I'm moving across the country and like, going to be experiencing a lot of really cool things and uh, having new adventures and making new friends and being able to kind of embrace and learn more about my Asian American heritage, but also like having a different set of students to work with and um, doing a different job, but also learning a lot of new things. And so I have to kind of balance the two of like knowing that there are really bad things in the world, but also not letting myself get so crippled by that, that I don't experience all the good things in the world. And um, you know, having, you know, laughs over random YouTube videos or, um, going outside and feeling the sun on your skin, like just little things like that. And I think for me, uh, practicing that, um, gratitude every day and being like finding little things throughout the day and being like, you know what, today was a good day just because I got to go outside and see the sun or today was a good day because I have a job. If I, mean, sometimes it's literally like. I woke up and I had food and I have a roof over my head. And if that's all it is, then that's okay. Um, Cause sometimes we have days like that. But for me, I think gratitude and being, you know, constantly reminded of the good things I have in life has been really important for me, especially in the past year and a half of so many hard things, so many things coming to light, so many hard conversations and so much loss. Um, that it's been really important for me to make sure that I'm grounded in my faith and in my people um, and the good things in the world instead of just being crippled by all the negative and hard things. Because if you look for it, you'll find it. But also if you look for the light and if you look for the good things, you'll find that too. So thanks for yeah, that. Dialogue. Dialogue. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I we're going to have to wrap up in a minute and I was going to ask if you wanted to say a few words, but that was like, I don't know how you would top the last thing that you just <laughs> said. <laughs> do, do you want to just say a few things or say hi, mom and dad? Or um, I don't know if my parents are watching, honestly. Um, <laughs> I think for me, I've just learned, you know, change is inevitable and the good and bad things are also inevitable, but you have to be willing to embrace the changes and the challenges and come go at it with like an attitude and like a posture of like i'm gonna step into the situation and i'm gonna try to learn as much as i can but i'm also trusting that my life background has prepared me for this moment or i can trust god that he will prepare me for this moment um especially if unexpected things come up um because things don't always go according to plan as i've learned i've planned a lot of things in my life none of them have really gone according to plan but i you know 
in my faith, whatever your faith might be, like for me, I've trusted that God has a plan for me. And I think that's been really helpful in, in figuring out like, what am I going to do next? Who knows? I have a general direction that I want to go that I think I want to go in. And then I'll kind of like let God take the lead in what exactly I do and let him show me the way and um, put people in my life that will help guide me in that way as well. And, you know, like I said, I try to look for the good in life, um, but also be realistic of like, you know, there are crappy things and there are really important things that you need to talk about. And you need to remember that not everyone has the same life experiences as you. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't continue to love and continue to look for the good in people and continue to like, you know, try for the best and, you know, hope for the best. So. Well, cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I close out, Denise, any other questions? Um, for, the, um, for Facebook? Hold on. Oh, I'm just me. making sure I, I didn't miss anybody. Okay. Well, and I, I want no, to we don't have any new questions. <laughs> thank you, Jeannie. I want to thank you um, for sharing your story. We've been doing a series this whole year where we have people come on and let us walk for a little while in their shoes. And because of that, just listening to someone's story is is an eye opening experience. And it's like, hey, we are a lot alike. And then there's areas where we're not a lot alike and let's everyone has value and wherever you've come from. And so um, you were very brave. Thank you. <laughs> you were worried about it. You, I would have been shocked to know that you were ever worried about this because you're a natural. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, thank your father, who was the person who got me uh, to meet you. And so, um, thank you, uh, whatever, uh, for, you know, letting us know, um, we CTC want to thank you for the event and, um, just, you know, you're, you're our partner now. So, uh, you also have CTC on top of Baylor as yes. a family. Yes. So, thank you so much. Yes. Um, so guys, we have more. This Wednesday, we have a very own Fort Hood CTC professor, Michael Walls, who is going to do um, not a life story. He is going to do a lesson, a history lesson on how Asian Pacific uh, people in America contributed to American history. So that's on Wednesday at noon. And all throughout the um, month, each day, we're going to go ahead and post another link. So make sure that you guys check out our social media. Thanks again. Um, you guys have an awesome day. I think the pouring down rain has ended and now we all have beautiful gardens and a lot of grass. So <laughs> go out, cut your grass and pull your weeds, but um, we needed that anyway. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Janice. Thank you, Grace. Thank you. Thank you. And you're welcome. We'll see you guys later. Take us out, Janice.